Okay, so um, today I want to talk, obviously, about the intersection of natural language processing and graph theory with Python. These are, um, for me, what I consider um, very bread and butter type of things that I deal with on, a, on an ongoing basis and um, having a, a good practical understanding of how to um, extract value from very messy real world data sets using these tools I think is a, should be of value to anybody that's either a practitioning data scientist or an aspiring data scientist. So um, you know the term data science is, um, is an interesting one. It, it um, you know, came around after I'd been doing this for a while. Um, I actually um, prefer the term, for, I consider myself still to be a, a mathematician, so forgive me if I get overly mathematical in some uh, aspects of this talk. If I do, please stop me and ask, question, ask questions. Um, and this is likely to uh, increase over time. The vast majority of this, of this unstructured data comes in the form of free text, so natural language human-generated text files. Everything from emails to tweets to log files to notes um, to transcripts, um, and then there are analogs, of course, in um, audio and video transcriptions of these things. Um, like in the previous talk, also described, there's also a you know tons of uh, data coming from you know clinical from clinical environments that contributes to this. Um, you know, and oftentimes these these unruly pieces of data are intermingled. With, uh, with more friendly pieces of structured information. And so sometimes the, um, the full weight of natural language processing techniques, such as uh, latent, latent Dirichlet allocation or other topic and semantic analysis, isn't always um, necessarily appropriate for, um, for some applications. Many times you want to just extract features from some text information and append that to a data set that you're working with as part of like your overall classification scheme. So imagine we were talking about um, you know, looking at employee records and you have their demographic information and you also have some information in a free text form like a comment as to why they quit their job or some information about their hobbies or things like that. Um, we would like to be able to transform that d data into a regular, um, into a regular coded object that we could then use as a feature for any downstream data science, you know, shenanigans. So rather than uh, go through and give you a um, you know, kind of a pedagogical um, exploration of natural language processing and graph theory from the ground up, what I decided I would do is go through and start with a motivating problem and discuss some of the, the necessary machinery from those techniques that are useful to solving the problem at hand. So, um, and I've always found, um, as someone who's picked up the programming and statistics and other things um, outside of mathematics to do this job, um, starting with a, with a problem and and kind of working, working from there was always a good way, to, good way to learn a lot of things. So here's the problem. Um, I was working with a trucking company uh, about a year ago, and I've since worked with several other trucking companies that have a problem with turnover. So in the trucking industry, uh, turnover it ranges from about 100 to 110 percent um, per year, uh, per company. For a large size company, this costs them anywhere from 20 to $50 million per year in turnover because of the associated costs with uh, training and insurance um, and things of that, things and bonuses and things of that nature. So um, they wanted me to tell them how to, uh, basically how to handicap the recruiting game. They wanted to know how to use data to better predict which drivers to hire based upon personality tests, work history, all sorts of stuff. Um, a lot of this data is, is fairly, uh, fairly structured and fairly friendly. Um, it's factor level data. It's um, you know, age, race, um, years of experience, um, you know, other demographic pieces of information. We also had personality test information, which was actually one of the more interesting aspects of this. But one thing that we had a lot of, too, was uh, free text information. And in particular, this, this little bit right here, reason for leaving. Um, and this was just something that an HR person um, entered into their application as they were doing as they were doing their interview. And I had a sneaking suspicion that this information might actually have some predictive value. The problem was that, um, and you'll see this in most data in most free text data sets of this nature, but in particular with um, with the truck with the inside of the domain of trucking, there was a lot of very colorful variation in spelling. <laughs> 
just just putting that out there. So, you know, I couldn't just rely on kind of basic grep sort of techniques um, and regex, sort of regex soup to, uh, to come out with some, first, I'll call it first order ca categorizations of reasons that drivers were leaving. Well, I also, across all these companies that I've worked with, I have hundreds of thousands of these records. Um, and as a mathematician, I've learned to use math mathematics to enforce my inherent laziness. Um, I had no interest in manually going through and uh, classifying enough of, the, enough of these samples to be able to use sort of the uh, traditional machinery of, um, of natu uh, supervised natural language processing and classification, um, such as like support vector machines or, th or things like that. So um, I decided I wanted to go back and come up, with, uh, come up with something that would save me a lot of time. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the motivating problem here is how do we transform the cornucopia of reasons for leaving to a finite set of codes and a finite set of codes that we could then use for any downstream analytics uh, processing, such as predicting who's going to quit based on the codes of their work history and that sort of thing. It could also be very useful for general business, uh, business intelligence applications. Uh, following from the last talk, the same, um, the same mechanism. I've actually used this uh, identical mechanism for classifying information in electronic medical records because ICD-9 codes are so um, poorly representative of information. So this basic concept of taking free text information, and I'm, when I say free text, in general, I'm describing short bursts of text not whole documents, but something on the order of a tweet or less, basically, and providing and then classifying it and saying what, what group it falls into. So this um, process follows um, a couple of steps, and I'm going to walk through each of those in turn. So the first, first part, uh, many of you are probably familiar with general methods of pre-processing. So that's um, getting rid of um, phantom Unicode errors and um, other formatting things. It's um, standardizing, standardizing the text. Essentially, it's the um, natural language processing analog of statistical normalization. Um, the next process that we're going to look at is how to, um, how to turn this text into a vectorized form so we can actually uh, do math with it. And then we're going to look at the elements of um, similarity detection and graph theory that get us the rest of the way there. Any questions up to this point? Okay, please feel free to. Uh, I would much rather you guys ask me questions as we're as we're going than, um, you know, you guys forgetting something interesting and holding it to the end. I'm just really curious how you like crack the uh, colorful spelling code. <laughs> <laughs> I will show you. It it is pretty interesting because there is, and I have a couple of. Uh, of examples that show just some of the variety that really that really was there in the in the data, we'll call it entropy. <laughs> <laughs> to be polite about it. Okay, so um, the first step in this process, of, as I mentioned, is uh, is pre-processing, and uh, for for what I've done in this application, it's just basic uh, basic uh, basic regex application where I am making sure that I am stripping out all of the non-alphabetic non characters, I'm, I'm converting them to lowercase, and I'm removing extraneous white spacing in the data. Um, this sort of thing um, is pretty quick, um, and I found that you can, um, if you were to API-ify this process, um, put it in Cython, and you will get, you know, easily get an order to a magnitude and performance improvement. And really, everything that I'm talking about today um, I have implemented in Cython and have APIs that do this. And um, you get, I think, something on the order when I'm, I have a variation of this that uses locality sensitive hashing as, a, as an optimization. But um, I can hash and classify a particular thing in under, it's something on the order of a hundredth of a millisecond. So it's very, very quick. So the, the, one of the most foundational aspects of natural language processing is, um, is representation. And um, I think, 
AJ, you asked about, uh, about the bag of words representation. And that's um, vectorization essentially is an elaboration of, of that same idea that, um, you know, there, in this case, we are not looking for, at least on the, the first pass, we are not making any assumptions about, about semantics in the data. We're really only looking for um, character level similarity. So, um, how many of you are familiar, uh, just raise a show of hands, with in, the idea of an n-gram? Perfect. Okay, so n-grams are, um, you know, n-grams are ordered sequences of, um, of words. And there are an unlimited number, well, I'm sure you, someone could, if you fixed the uh, set of the English language, you could compute the number of possible n-grams, but essentially it's, it's nearly infinite dimensional set. Of, um, of possible sequences of, of terms um, taken in, at a time, in words at a time. For brief texts, um, this, um, unnecessarily, um, this unnecessarily expands the dimensionality of the problem. And for any of you who have worked in machine learning or any other pattern recognition tasks, you'll know that as the dimensionality of the problem increases, the um, efficacy of the mathematical machinery very quickly breaks down. So it's our famous curse of dimensionality. So in lieu, because our motivation was to find things that were inherently talking about something that was similar, um, but not necessarily kind of getting at the gestalt of the idea, um, using character, le character level um, n-grams, or what um, some, some in the literature refer to as k-grams, which are consecutive sequences of, of, of alphabetic or alphanumeric characters, was a much more dimensionally appropriate representation of the data. Um, so this, um, so essentially for, for, um, for A through Z, essentially, we are creating a feature space, so a vector, of all possible combinations, in this case, of three consecutive characters, so AAA, AAB, AAC, and whenever a, uh, whenever a particular reason for leaving um, expresses a, um, a, one of those uh, three-letter codes, we will um, create a vector that has a, um, a one uh, representing that that, that, that uh, particular subsequence is present. So we end up with a, with a fairly high dimensional binary, uh, binary uh, feature vector for every one of our, um, every one of our reasons for leaving. Now this is the, um, this type of representation is actually the underlying, um, underlying model for uh, leucine, which sits behind Elasticsearch, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So whenever you're using Elasticsearch to do um, like keyword-based searching, um, that's what Elasticsearch is using. It's actually making comparisons in this, um, in this n-gram feature space. Um, uh, and I believe they're using a cosine distance in that, in that space. So once, um, once we've vectorized this information, um, then it's really a free-for-all as to what types of uh, mathematics that you can apply. So for instance, if we were to go back here and say, if a priori I actually had a subset of the data where these codes, I just went through manually and applied some codes to these um, just for effect. If I manually had a large enough data set of these and I had converted all of these to vectors, I could um, use a supervised training algorithm such as a support vector machine or neural networks to, um, to classify what this code would be based upon um, future observations in this transform vector space. Um, but again, manually classifying the data is uh, very time intensive and also um, tends to bake in some of our uh, human assumptions into the process, which might not be necessary. Uh, just a quick aside, you know, on this whole topic of, you know, vector space representations really um, kind of sits behind this whole field of, um, of natural language research. Um, and search engines called you know, information retrieval. And um, this text uh, by, by Manning and his, and his team is um, extremely, I thought extremely well done. It's, um, I believe came out in 2013 or 2014 and just gives a very, very nice summary of, um, of the field. And um, I make all the people who join my team read this because it's, uh, I, it definitely is a very informative survey. And, we do this sort of thing every day in various contexts. So having, uh, having a good basis in NLP and, and the underlying algorithms associated with it is important. 
So here I, uh, I have an example. Um, I have converted from my like, super optimized uh, Cython representation just for readability here as to how we go about vectorizing a string given a, given a finite feature space. So in this case, our feature space is all uh, is A through Z with a space. And um, I use the awesome power of NumPy to, um, to do the rest. So um, once this is posted online, um, and I can also sh directly share my Git repos um, with anybody who's interested to uh, play around with this play around with this so you can start vectorizing your own code. And all aspects of this um, I have represented in both R and Python if anybody is interested in playing with it. Now, do you have a sense of um, where it starts to break down in terms of so the way the words when the length of the comment becomes long? Yes. And that's why I said really it, it tends to follow on the order of complexity of a tweet. Okay. Um, so once you really get beyond a couple of sentences um, the, the signal to noise ratio and the data just blows up and that you, um, I found, well, yeah, you saturate the feature space essentially. Um, and so that's, yeah, it, you're exactly right. The, um, what I found ways to get around that are, um, and so you can get a little bit more meat off the bone to get to whole documents or at least multiple paragraphs and still be able to assess similarity, is that you want to do some, you want to extract certain parts of, um, fluffy parts of speech. Um, so you wanna use something like a grammatical parser to pull out, pull out the nouns, pull out the adjectives, and then you're really getting more domain specific with uh, your analysis at that point. And so you're only encoding the, you're extracting and then only encoding the terms in a vectorized form that are following certain, you know, uh, grammatical um, processes? That's a good question. So um, kind of the, the next step in, the, in this process is we want to be able to go from, to take a set of vectors, a, a set of vectorized text, and look at the pairwise similarity of everything in our corpus. So I want, if I have 50,000 reasons for leaving, or 50,000 tweets, or 50,000 um, notes and patient charts, I want to be able to say pairwise, so we'll create a big matrix, a similarity matrix, that says um, for, you know, from you know, um, element i to j, how similar any of the, how any arbitrary two pairs mm. of, um, of vectors are. So there is a, um, how I'll do another show of hands just so I get an idea. Um, how many are, of you are familiar with uh, kernel methods or support vector machines and, and things of that nature? Okay, so a little bit. So basically, in a, in a nutshell, kernels are, um, and I'm sure kernels are used colloquially in a lot of different contexts, but in this context, kernels are meant to be are meant to describe something as a generalized inner product, which is not necessarily the same thing as distance um, between two elements, but essentially it's affecting measures of uh, measures of similarity um, in a um, we'd say a reproducing kernel Hilbert space as mathematicians, but. Uh, essentially, we're, we're mapping from one domain into another domain where we can meaningfully assess similarity. Um, and what we get from this is a, um, a if we have, say, 50,000 documents, we'll create a big matrix in NumPy that has the pairwise um, kernel similarity between any two vector form uh, documents noted in, the, noted in this matrix. So the way that... Um, that the figures that are represented in here, um, that they calculate distance is based upon um, the what I call the Hamming similarity, which is essentially the number of the number of bits that these vectors have in common. Because I'm representing them as a as a in a binary feature space, um, I decided that it was most appropriate to use um, a a kernel that really captures the nature of binary feature data, which is Hamming distance. Now, depending on, depending on your application and the dimensionality of the data, many people will use radial basis functions, which are essentially Gaussian kernels. Um, and those are ones that um, are often, if you make the assumption that there's some inherent clustering in your data, that when you map the data in um, using radial basis functions into this, into this kernel space, that um, the Gaussian kind of nature of the data um, really 
really shines. And um, if say that if you have two, uh, two clusters in the data that they might in a, if you're using Euclidean distance, they might kind of look scattered and overlapped. Um, but when you use a radial basis function that those um, Gaussian clusters really tighten up in the, in the data set. And so when they tighten up like that in the kernel, in this, in this induced uh, feature space, um, it's a lot easier to draw a line through them, which is really the whole basis of most of this mathematics, is that we're, we're trying to use a very high, we're trying to draw very high dimensional lines through patterns. And so it makes that task much, much easier. And again, um, just for literature purposes, this is a fantastic text on um, the use of kernel methods for pattern recognition and machine learning, which I highly recommend. And it um, also exhaustively covers um, the whole idea of uh, support vector machines as well. So um, what we have here is, um, this is the Hamming similarity of, um, so my data set here is from zero to roughly, uh, we'll say seven or 8,000 of these observations is the from, th so um, one to one of course has the highest level of similarity. And in this case, I've I've, this is a, I used a rank reduced um, representation. So uh, up to 32 bits is the maximum. And uh, so this is just the identity. So uh, resigned is 32 bits similar to itself. And then um, here I set a cutoff of 10 bits worth of similarity and everything above here is shown here. So as I promised, lots of variety in spellings of the word resigned. Um, we also have um, coupled in a few, a few other terms that's not just saying resigned, but resigned's company moved, um, e-signed, resigned, um, anywho. <laughs> Um, so the reason that I sh the reason that I showed this graph was um, we need to at some point in order to make the translation from just this pairwise this pairwise uh, similarity matrix this kernel matrix to a graph we have to draw a line in the sand and say what is close what is similar in the, in this space so is that does, do I draw the line at ten bits of worth of similarity is it eight bits is it fifteen bits. Um, there are a variety of methods for doing this, um, and I found that in many applications, it's perfectly okay to generate a plot that looks like this and draw a line through the axis and just eyeball it and say, where do I draw my cutoff? Now, there are, um, there's a method that I developed um, that I'm, I've not yet published but I used in um, a, the project that I referenced earlier, um, not for trucking, but with um, actually for the state's infant mortality initiative where I was mining all of these medical records looking at causes of death. And I used the same technique, but um, I wanted to have a much more rigorous way of drawing, of drawing the similarity cutoff. And so um, I actually used uh, techniques of something that's called data spectroscopy, which is where we use the, um, the set of eigenfunctions of this, of this kernel similarity matrix, um, which has some really interesting properties. So the majority, if you were to look at a histogram, if I were to expand this out like this and to show um, the histogram of, um, of similarities, it's actually a bimodal distribution. For the most part, most observations pairwise are not that similar to each other, and they have a particular orbit of dissimilarity, and it's somewhere around here. Um, but there are enough observations in the tail that there's actually a second bump. So here's our first, here's our first, similar, here's our first curve of similarity, here's our second curve. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out where does the second, where does the second bump of similarity occur in the data? And um, there are some method, there are several methods for you know, detecting bimodal distributions in data and looking at their properties. Most of them are hand wavy at best and two are also computationally um, too expensive to be scalable. So um, what I did was I took the same kernel similarity matrix that we've developed and I looked at the spectral properties of that data. And what I've actually found was that if you um, look at not the, um, if you think of what generates this data, well, what generates this data in this space are eigenfunctions. Um, the first eigenfunction is responsible for, um, 
the big, you know, essentially the big bump of dissimilar items. So all the chaff is like right here. That's the first eigenfunction. It dominates the signal. Most things are not similar to anything else in the data set. So that's our first curve. That's described by the first eigenfunction. The second eigenfunction actually describes this, long, this, uh, this other bump of more similar items on, on the tail. And um, I can actually take the, um, so empirically, I can take the second eigenvector of the, of the kernel uh, similarity matrix and take its average, and it actually gives me the centroid of that second cluster, which is really cool. Um, and so that is essentially an algorithmic mechanism for drawing this line. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that in more in detail or share, uh, share my preprints with anybody who's interested. So here is a little code snippet for, um, for computing that using um, pandas and scikit-learn, which are, if you're not familiar with those, um, pandas essentially gives us all of the, um, all of the beauty of uh, data frames that we get from R and allows us to use them in Python. And scikit-learn is the, um, basically the bread and butter um, machine learning package that one uses in, in Python. So, how do we get from that to graph theory? Um, so as I was describing earlier, we need to be able to draw a line in the sand to say how similar is similar for me to say that they're talking about the same thing. That was the whole basis of, of, this, of this previous discussion. So um, what we want to do is we want to go from this pairwise uh, kernel matrix to an adjacency matrix. Now an adjacency matrix is the fundamental data structure of graph theory. Basically everything else in graph theory follow, follows from this, um, this particular data structure which shows the pairwise connectivity. So if this is the first node, second node, third node, first node, second node, third node, um, if it's a zero, we say it's not connected um, to, the, to the node. If it's a one, we say that the two nodes are connected. So that's that in a nutshell. Um, and so um, the way we do that is we set this threshold here. So the pairwise similarity between nodes I and J, if it's less than, uh, less than or equal to a certain threshold, this threshold could either be our eyeball, our eyeball threshold or it could be the one that's algorithmically derived. Um, but ultimately, we want to go from this, this similarity structure here where we're saying, all of these things, if I had a graph of all of my elements, um, because I'm saying everything above 10 is similar, then this graph here could represent all of the various flavors of resigned um, that are now connected based on this graph structure. All right. Questions? Yes? So in the future, would you recommend to these companies that they just have a survey where there's like 30 I already did that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually, um, so one thing that my, that my group does a lot of are, um, we call them like data strategy projects, where it's not a full-fledged like data science engagement where we're really going in and I'm trying to predict something or solve something. It's just more or less looking at the landscape of data that they have available to them and saying, this is what you could do with it. This is like all the meat that's sitting on the bone that we could slice off in various ways to provide value. And um, that is one of my um, most common recommendations is, is standardizing things like that, just for that. Develop that list from, from the past data. Yes, yep. Yeah, so it wouldn't be coming from nowhere. Um, and then at, at worst case, you have an additional text box if, if you have a, such a rare reason for quitting that can't be described by those top 30, then fill in the form and you know, we'll make do. That would be a smaller number so that you could go through it through Yes, yeah, so you end up going to a review by exception model rather than um, have reviewing everything model. <laughs> so, um, so how do we actually go about the business of analyzing graphs with, with Python? Um, there are two primary packages that I like to use. Um, one is NetworkX and another is iGraph. Um, iGraph, is, um, iGraph is by far more developed 
in terms of the number of algorithms that are, baked, that are baked into it. It's based on C, it runs a lot faster. It also has the benefit of being able to, um, of having almost all, the exact same functionality in C, R, and Python. So if you're um, like me and you go frequently back and forth between R and Python, it's easy to, uh, to translate between them. Um, the problem with iGraph, um, and I actually recently was living, living through this pain, was that it has a lot of dependencies on Cairo. Um, and me being um, busy and not thinking about it, um, it took me a while to upgrade to Yosemite. <laughs> and when I did, all of my stuff broke <laughs> with Cairo. So, um, yeah, so, so what you're seeing here is based on NetworkX. Even though um, I like uh, iGraph a, a lot better for visualizations, NetworkX has really good SVG-based visualizations um, that um, are really friendly to work with and the, um, you know, the whole plotting functionality and is really great. It's just that it's, NetworkX tends to be quite lacking when it comes to um, anything more than like basic pathfinding algorithms and some really basic uh, like linear algebra on, on graphs. Big problems with both of these frameworks is memory. Um, that once you, once you get into the couple hundred thousand node range on either one of these, um, even more so if you're playing around in um, IPython, it breaks down really quickly. Um, the kernel will crash all the time. Um, and so in order to kind of go to the next level where you're wanting to deal with millions of nodes um, into the tens of millions of nodes, I would highly recommend looking at uh, Neo4j, which is a um, which is a native graph database that's um, built in uh, it's built in Java. Um, has a lot of um, Apache guts in it. So um, if any of you are comfortable with working with uh, working with Java, um, you can write custom algorithms that that sit inside of that. Um, just a very um, it's not as it's not going to be very um, you know horizontally scalable. Um, as, as, as we would like and are used to with other tools like Hadoop or Spark, um, but it definitely gets the job done in most reasonable contexts. And then anything beyond that scale, um, at this point, you're really going to be stuck uh, doing custom development. So right now, um, I'm developing a um, custom fraud solution for the state of Indiana um, for tax fraud. So I'm mining all of the tax returns. Um, and looking and doing anomaly detection at scale, but with billions of records pulling in from, you know, pulling in from dozens of various data sources. So everything from not just tax returns, but BMV records, um, looking at vital records, um, property taxes, business filings, all this stuff. And um, in order to do that meaningfully, um, you have to have some pretty specialized hardware and, and database structure. So we're actually at this point using uh, SAP HANA's uh, which is a very, very large, it's a one terabyte in memory uh, database that allows us to do this, yeah. So, so think Redis, but on steroids. Um, and so that's, that's been pretty fun. Anywho, going on. So how do we go from a graph to labels? Um, and that lies essentially in clustering on the graph. So there's a term we use, it's uh, community, community detection, which is finding essentially small, uh, communities of mutually connected neighbors inside of this large graph. So in this case, we're looking for neighbors uh, um, which are talking about the same reasons that they left their last job. Um, the technique that we use for this is called walk trap community detection, which essentially is like a, uh, it's a random walk inside of the graph. And it's um, essentially just crawling over the graph and deciding whether or not I'm in the same neighborhood or I've left to another neighborhood and drawing lines in the sand when it thinks it's left its neighborhood. So it's a very valuable technique, um, very straightforward to use. The code, there's a lot of heavy math behind it, um, but fortunately, uh, NetworkX and iGraph are, are friendly enough to have uh, reduced it to two lines of code for us. So it's, um, in terms of uh, power versus accessibility, this is a, um, you know, something that you can just go out and start playing with today and, and getting value out of the data without having to, you know, I, I always encourage, I hate when people just black box things. So I'd always recommend that you try to understand what the guts are behind the algorithm, how it's actually working, because you know, the quickest way to let a deliverable get away from you is to not understand how something actually works. 
and then it doesn't work again in the future when someone, someone tries to use it. Uh, so, tr so you know, do a little research and figure out um, for yourself how these various graph clustering algorithms work, um, but there's a lot that you can get from them. Sorry, yes? Is that a click finder, or what, is, what are they using? Are they finding clicks, or are they finding... It's walk, it's, so it's a walk trap community detection, oh, okay. so, yeah. So it's... Um, Essentially, it's looking, it's looking at the escape velocity out of, out, of a, um, out of a set of initially randomly generated clusters, and yeah. Okay, so here's what we get for our money. Um, so this is the result of the work I just went through and screenshotted some of the clusters because there were thousands of observations. But we see we have our group now, um, and the group was this. These are our groups. Why did it decide to do that to me? There we go. Thank you. Um, so, and here's what we've been what we've been working for. We wanted a set of, of fixed labels for non-fixed text. So, um, so here we could see like, and these are just a couple of examples. Um, and I'm happy to give you the uh, de-identified data set that has all of the all the text for this, so you could play with it. But for the first group, it was just they wanted to try something different. That's why that's why they left. The second group was that they went to go work for somebody else. Um, group eight over here was basically that, you know, contractual things that they were they were um, essentially hired gun contractors. Four, um, they wanted to get back into truck driving, and so they're talking about why they left their last job. They were in some other non-trucking field, which is actually an extremely useful predictor of, um, of um, retention. Uh, six, um, they um, wanted to work over the road rather than local driving. Um, and nine, there was that they had had some accidents. So you can see there's a lot of, there's a lot of variability um, I wanted to show you guys something deeper than just variations on a theme of resigned. Um, and so I hope that this kind of captures kind of the idea of what we can do with this, that we can take really crappy text um, and get something out of it. We can, get a, we can get sets of labels that we can then use to make predictions. I could go in and say, all right, uh, combining all the demographics, demographic information with um, everything with, um, with this information and, and make predictions about what's, what they're going to do in the future. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of value for me in using techniques like this and I hope that, um, you know, as, as you guys go out and do more natural language processing type, type things that you can use this workflow to, uh, you know, get a handle on some of the, some of the noise. So, all right, that's, that's my talk. Any uh, quick questions? I have, a, I think I have a few minutes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did you deal with understanding how many buckets you needed? I didn't have to pick the number of buckets. Yeah, well, so, so the community detection algorithm is looking for finite, finite um, subsets or subgraphs in in the in the knowledge graph as a whole. So it makes no a priori assumptions about the number of uh, latent clusters that are there, like you would if you were using a k-means uh, k-means style algorithm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk more about that later. Yes? Uh, how do you delimit bias uh, for cases that syntactically they look similar, but within the context of how things happen, they are rather different? Uh, because it's very easy to look at text and uh, words and assign weight values to them. Sure. So because we are dealing with such uh, short snippets of text and within a very, within a, a generally very restrained context, um, that's, not been, um, that's not been an issue in practice and that's not really been the motivation for, um, for the algorithm in general. Like I make no assumptions of, um, of syntactic relevance. Often I found that that does come out in the wash um, and that things that are talking about the same thing that aren't using the same words tend to fall into the same group, but um, yeah, but I don't make any a priori assumptions about, about syntax. Yes, in the back. Uh, 
it works extremely well, actually. Um, so, um, you know, in the focus of the paper that I'm, that I'm developing right now, that's something where I try to go back and, and make the connection between these sort of spectral properties of the data and the, the um, intuitive, the intuitive sense. So, um, that's definitely something that becomes very apparent when you are like backtracking through the data and you are looking at these thresholds manually. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, two questions. One is, um, how sensitive is that? Well, it's not a continuous space. I will stop you there, because it's, it's a binary feature space. So In the kernel method, though, yeah. to apply the similarity, that should be a continuous space. Or, oh, no, because you're discrete. So you're Hamming, discrete. Hamming kernel. So Hamming yeah. is fine. You're, you're discrete. OK. Um, so in that case, though, when you apply that threshold, is, that trans is, is the clusters that you end up with sensitive to the threshold that you pick? Well, naturally, is naturally it's going to be because it's going to it's going to influence the the overall size. It's going to end up, you know, as you down as you down weight, you're going to end up dilating the size of the communities and actually um, increasing the um, you know the subgraph the entropy within the subgraph. Sure. So so yeah. yeah. No. No, I, f I found that the, um, when you really look at, and I should have, I should have put that in here, um, and I'm happy to discuss that with you later, but the, um, if you're actually looking at the similarity distribution as, you know, as a histogram, that there, that there's enough, um, that there's enough space between the, we'll call it the everything else group and the group of similars, that there's enough room in between, that that's not been an issue in practice. There's, there's not a very, it's not a very fine line. It drops off quickly. Yes. So that was an awesome talk. Um, Thank you. We, so one of the challenges that I had, I talked about like building graphs on Reddit, was performance. Yes. Um, it's not trivial to calculate that matrix. Yes. For millions of, for example, users in, in social media. Mm -hmm. um, So I have I have a few colleagues that, that work with GPUs. Um, one of the best optimizations that I found here, and I don't discuss it because it's a it's a whole world into itself. Um, in practice, I use an additional optimization where I use something called locality sensitive hashing, where I actually map from this higher dimensional feature space into a finite set of codes. And because I'm working in this finite space that preserves enough similarity, I'm able to do a, a lot with um, fairly limited hardware. Um, like I can do, you know, ridiculous amounts of things with just my laptop um, once I reduce it to that space. Um, but once you're really getting to like, like government level scale data, then you do have to break out customized hardware. And typically, and I have massively paralyzed processes for, um, and I'm using Cython with this as well. <laughs>